potential revolutionary situation exists in any country where the government consistently fails to ensure at least a minimally decent standard of life for the majority of its people. Or where powerful, possessing minority flagrantly denies elementary human rights to millions of race. Or where reactionary corrupt ruler or hunter inflicts countless cruelties on the people over whom he or they exercise despotic power. In such situations, the motivation for a people's revolutionary war exists. And if there is, or can be created, the nucleus of a clandestine revolutionary party able to supply leadership, doctrine and organization, only one ingredient is needed. Weaponry. It is often said that guerrilla warfare is primitive. This generalization is dangerously misleading and true only in the technological sense. If one considers the picture as a whole, a paradox is immediately apparent. The primitive form is in fact more sophisticated than nuclear war or war as it is waged by conventionally minded and equipped armies, navies and air forces. Revolutionary people's wars are not dependent for success on the efficient operations of complex mechanical devices, highly organized logistical systems or the accuracy of electronic computers. They can be conducted in any terrain, in any climate, in any weather, in jungles, in swamps, in mountains, in deserts. Their basic element is man, and man is more complicated than any of his machines. He is endowed with intelligence, emotions and will. Thus, these wars are suffused with, and reflect, man's admirable qualities as well as his less pleasant ones. While not always humane, they are at least human, which is more than can be said for the strategy of extinction. Long live Chairman Mao. Long live Chairman Mao. Behind those faces lurks fanaticism. The fanaticism that made the Chinese Communist Revolution. It is National Day, 1 October 1966, and the great proletarian cultural revolution has just begun. Old culture, old ideology, old customs, old traditions, all of the olds must be destroyed. This was the slogan used by the Red Guards who suddenly appeared during August 1966. Anything feudalistic, capitalistic, or revisionistic was destroyed or changed to suit the needs of revolution. Names of towns and streets and even localities were changed. Wall newspapers were plastered in cities and towns, often criticizing men long established. Some were purged. Liu Ping, head of Peking University. Liu Qingyi, chief of the party's propaganda department. Lo Ri Ching, chief of staff of the PLA, were all criticized and purged. Even chief of state, Liu Xiaoqi, was included in the first sweeping move. Chairman Mao, was it necessary to create the situation you call revolution? It seems that most people in the world cannot understand the situation. Chairman Mao, for the last 30 years you fought through revolutions and battles and won a victory. 
you established a new country and ruled it continuously for 18 years. But still you stirred up another revolution and thus destroyed the concept of revolution held by most people. Chairman Mao, what reason did you have to bring about this cultural revolution? We would like to study your path and sift through the history of China to seek the answer. First, we want to recall your own words written in 1927. A revolution is not a dinner party, or writing an essay, or painting a picture, or doing embroidery. It cannot be so refined, so leisurely and gentle, so temperate, kind, courteous, restrained, and magnanimous. A revolution is an act of insurrection, an act of violence by which one class overthrows another. 3,000 students gather in front of Tiananmen on 4 May 1917, shouting, China is for the Chinese people. They were protesting the actions of the Chinese government in giving way to the Japanese 21 demands. This was the May 4th movement, the beginning of years of protest and revolt. Eight years before, on 10 October 1911, a group of army officers attempted to take over the decaying Manchu dynasty, which had ruled China since the mid-17th century. The Empress Dowager, who held power during the latter part of the Qing dynasty, crushed an earlier group which had been alarmed over China's defeat during the 1895 war with Japan and was trying to bring about reform. The reformists persisted and eventually overturned the Manchu government in the widespread Wuchang Uprising of 1911. Sun Yat-sen received news of the revolution while he was in the United States. He returned to China, assumed the presidency of a provincial government, and established the Republic of China. But the fruits of revolution were never realized as expeditionary forces from the north soon took over. The history of China's defeat and humiliation during the 19th century begins in 1842 when the British defeated Qing forces and signed the Nanking Treaty during the Opium War. England's colonial foothold began a great power struggle with the United States, Russia, France, Japan, and finally Germany carving out spheres of influence, economic and territorial concessions which they backed with military force. China became a paradise for foreigners and a hell on earth for the Chinese. Shanghai especially became a western city, alien to the Chinese.
The military destroyed all opposition, however slight. Shaoshan, Shantan, Xian, Fudan Province is Mao Zedong's birthplace. Mao, you were born when China was in a miserable condition. Later, you said to Edgar Snow, there were two parties in my home. One was my father, who was the chairman. The opposition party included myself, my mother and younger brother, and sometimes our hired hand, biography of a revolutionary. In 1919, when the May 4th movement began to spread, you were in Changsha. You were only 17 at the time of the Wuchang uprising and spent half a year in the Revolutionary Army. Between those two dates, you organized the Xinmen Shuixi, the New People's Study Society. After the May 4th movement, you started editing the Yang River Review for Hunan students. Even in those days, before you had studied Marxism, you had solutions for complex problems. What is the biggest problem of society? It is the problem of food. What is the most powerful force? It is the downtrodden people when their strength is used. Therefore, the people must fight with united strength. July 1926, the People's Revolutionary Army faces the military might of the Northern Armies, led by Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, regarded as the likely successor of Sun Yat-sen, who died the year before. Many members of the Chinese Communist Party were in both the People's Revolutionary Army and in the Guomindang, for at this time it was the policy of the CCP to follow a dual course of action. It was also the policy of Joseph Stalin at that time guiding the Communist parties of the world through the common turn to collaborate with the bourgeois world. The people in various areas where destruction by the military had been severe supported the People's Revolutionary Army. Workers contributed toward this new revolutionary army, a new provincial city government represented by laborers, students, citizens, was established in Shanghai. However, the contradiction between workers' organizations and military seeking stability with foreign powers was like an unstable explosive bound to detonate. On 12 April 1927, the explosion came, and the end of the communist KMT collaboration was a tragic bloodbath following a coup d'etat and KMT takeover in Shanghai. In Hunan, meantime, Mao had set up the National Farmers Movement Study School. Mao, you were heading the school when the CCP was established in 1921. For a time, during the KMT-CCP collaboration, the movement prospered, and years later, when the revolution was successful, this was a movement which praised as most characteristic of the farmers. In fact, during the early part of 1927, just before the Shanghai coup, you visited Hunan farmers and wrote a report, Survey of the Hunan Peasants Movement, which very well describes the struggles of the farmer and forms the basis for revolution. Your thinking was contradicted by other communist leaders who believe revolution must be started by city workers, the urban base of Lenin. When the 1927 coup spread through Changsha, you went underground and began organizing the farmers.
Here you are making a speech at a conference of peasant representatives. The strength of peasants is like a windstorm and is increasing. Peasants will remove the net restraining and move straight along the path of liberation. They will send all imperialists and army cliques into their graves. Sixteen October, 1934. After recovering from malaria, you start on a famous long march. You were not quite 41 at the time, and your entire belongings consist of only two blankets, a bleached cotton sheet, a waterproof cloth, an old umbrella, and a few books. Because Guomindang forces were nearby, you had to leave without specific destination in mind. This is how the army looked. Not much spit and polish. But though seedy looking, the People's Liberation Army was disciplined. It followed three main rules of discipline, did not create inconvenience to the people, and the eight points for attention were strictly enforced. Mao, you organized 1,000 armed farmers and took them into the Qinggang Mountains and waited for Judah to arrive from Nanchang, where he had organized a rebellion. Then with you, you organized the Autumn Harvest Uprising and showed it what you meant by peasant-based revolution. You became the party representative, and Judah became the military commander, and that was how the Red Army was formed. Then the Red Army instilled political views among farmers surrounding the Qingkang Mountains and gradually built up the liberated areas. It was when your wife was captured by the Guomindang and killed when she refused to announce that she was divorced from you. Rikin Guangxi, 1931. At an important conference of Soviet territories liberated by the Red Army, you were elected head of the provincial controlled government, even though party leadership was in the hands of the ultra leftists under Wan Ming, who headed the students recently returned from Moscow. The long march proved to be the test for future CCP leadership, which is ultimately yours. Now you are a poet. This is what you wrote after the long march. No one in the Red Army fears the hardship of the long march. We look lightly on the thousand peaks and the ten thousand rivers. The five mountains rose and fell like rippling waves. The Wumang Mountains were no more than small green pebbles. Warm were the sheer precipices when Gold Sand River dashed into them. Gold were the iron chain bridges over the Tatu, delighting in the thousand snowy hills of the Wind Mountains, the last pass vanquished, three armies smiled. Chairman Mao, the Red Army, led by you, fought against the enemy and marched through 12,500 kilometers of mountains and rivers and finally arrived at the Soviet area in northern Shenzhen in October 1935. The army, which began with 300,000, had dwindled to less than 30,000, but the survivors burned with firm revolutionary conviction. Every communist must grasp this truth, you wrote, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Mao, three years before you led the long march, the Japanese London Army 
bombed the railroad at Yutikau and announced the Chinese did it. In ensuing military actions, Chiang Sui Yang attacked. But the Japanese took Manchuria at the end of a three month campaign, installed Pui as emperor, and proclaimed the state of Manchukuo. This flagrant invasion resulted in violent anti Japanese sentiment by the Chinese who carried out anti-Japanese education, demonstrations, strikes, and terrorism, which the Chinese government promptly suppressed. While the Chang government in Nanking resisted Japan with one hand and suppressed anti-Japanese elements in China with the other, Yu Mao set forth a policy of stopping the internal strife and joining in a united front against Japan. Thus, you and the Communist Party made clear your strong sentiment of nationalism. He did not settle down in a cave in Yunnan after the long march. Edgar Snow interviewed Joe and Rai in January 1936 and also called on you at Bawan. It was the first interview you gave to a foreign correspondent. Snow said later about you, you cannot dispute the fact that one can feel a certain strength of faith in this man. He has a strange capability of consolidating and expressing the demands of a majority of several hundred million people who are farmers. Here lies the great quality of this man. If these movements can be generated into motive power for the rebirth of China, Mao Zedong will remain a great man in China's long history. Chairman Mao, you consolidated forces to resist Japan. You organized the Resist Japan Red Army College with Lin Biao as its head. Yunnan was organized as a base for revolution. Many similar bases were established elsewhere in China. Masses were gathered and trained at those bases. Thus preparations for Japan, resistance were complete. The Revolutionary War is a war of the masses. It can be waged only by mobilizing the masses and relying on them. Twelve December, 1936. As a result of a series of events during which considerable anti-Chang propaganda is circulated, the Generalissimo flies to Shun in an attempt to persuade Chang Sui Liang to fight the Red Army. But Chiang Kai-shek finds himself in prison. And in an effort to convince him to join the communists and fight off the Japanese, Yu Mao sent Zhou Enlai to Shan. Shan finally capitulates, thus ending an internal fight lasting 10 years. 28 July 1937. The Sino-Japanese War begins in earnest after the Japanese shell Marco Polo Bridge near Peking. The Japanese war machine sweeps ahead, capturing Tientsin on 31 July, Peking on 4 August, and attacking Shanghai on 13 August. The 
On 14 August 1937, the Nationalist government issues a proclamation calling for an all-out defense of China, prepares to defend Shanghai, and accepts communist help in the national defense effort. The Red Army was brought into the KMT Army and was known as the 8th Root Army and the new 4th Root Army with their own commanders. The overall command under the personal direction of Chiang Kai-shek fought well, but proved no match for the Japanese, who captured Shanghai in October and Nanking on 13 December. According to the record of the Tokyo trial, J Japanese occupation forces killed 300,000 Chinese soldiers and civilians in Nanking. Chairman Mao, here you formulated your theory of protracted war. Even though China cannot win immediate victory, you wrote, she will eventually win because she fights a war of justice, can fight a protracted war which will prove costly to the enemy, and can easily gain foreign support. Meantime, in the areas around Yunnan, and in Yunnan itself, plans are underway to develop a self-sufficient economy in preparation for a long-range war. You divide the anti-Japanese war into three stages. The first stage, Japan advance, China defend, is already being fought. People from the Japanese-occupied territories flock to Yunnan, among them the movie actress Lan Ting, later to be known as Chang Ching, your future wife. You prepare and train many of these people, some to be soldiers, others for other tasks. Even a small spark can burn out a fever, you write. You organize gorillas from among the farmers. These farmer gorillas organized elsewhere fight a skillful 24-hour-a-day battle against the Japanese. Twenty-seven October, 1938, the Japanese capture Wuhan. The Guomindang government moves to Chongqing. The second stage of the anti-Japanese war begins as China moves into positive resistance. Despite air raid, Chongqing is comparatively safe. It is a natural fortress, barred from easy access by intervening mountains and the swift young sea. With weapons shipped in increasing quantities from the United States, the nationalists build their forces and wait for an advantageous time. Meantime, World War II begins in Europe. Japan is soon at war with the United States and England. China now has powerful allies.
April 1945, the 7th Congress of the Chinese Communist Party. In reality, it celebrates her victory. Liu Xiaoqi reports on the party. You explain China's fate and development in Marxist-Leninist terms, which become the principal ideology of the Chinese Communist Party. You have led the party through war and carried out rectification within the party. The rectification movement started in 1942 and culminated in this meeting of the 7th Congress and was to eliminate defects and improve the general character of the party. Party members carried out criticism and self-criticism, party training and self-reform. The Red Army has become a disciplined, effective fighting force, able to carry out training and extensive operations simultaneously. Meantime, the war is drawing to an end. Your third stage of the resistance to Japan begins with the participation of Russian forces on 8 August. Six days later, the Japanese accept unconditional surrender. The nationalist government orders the Japanese army not to surrender to the 8th route and new 4th route armies. It uses the United States airlift to remove the Japanese army. The 8th route and new 4th route armies also remove the Japanese. To September 1945, the surrender aboard the Missouri. A nationalist representative attends the meeting. Your party has grown enormously and now controls a large territory with a population of about 100 million. You write, weapons are an important factor of war, but they are not decisive. It is people, not things that are decisive. The contest of strength is not only a contest of military and economic power, but also a contest of human power and people. Military and economic power is necessarily wielded by people. Chairman Mao, on 28 August 1945, you take your first plane ride from Yunnan to Chongqing. You had accepted an invitation from Chiang Kai-shek to discuss peace and were warmly received. A year before, the United States envoy General Patrick Hurley visited you in Yunnan for the purpose of developing an agreement with Chiang. After a long conference, you and Hurley did make a draft, but the KMT issued a separate proposal and the issue remained unsettled. This meeting ended the same way. Despite your great popularity, the talks accomplished nothing. You signed an agreement on 10 October, but it was practically meaningless, and you returned to Yunnan the next day. July 1946, the Guomintang Army opens an all-out offensive against the People's Liberation Army, as it has recently been renamed. Equipped with United States planes and weapons, the nationalist forces soon capture over 50 cities and towns and 30% of the territory in the Northeast. Yunnan fell to the Kuomintang in 1947, but the PLA did not fight a war of position, 
Instead, it drew in the KMT forces in a war of deadly attrition that cost 1,120,000 KMT casualties by the end of the first year. The PLA opened a counteroffensive when the nationalist strength was dispersed and the source of supply removed. During the 1947 fall and winter offensive, the KMT army in the northeast lost 31 towns and cities, much of the territory and 220,000 men. At the end of 1948, it was total surrender and 500,000 men were disarmed. Many nationalist soldiers volunteered into the PLA. Mountains of abandoned U.S. weapons were taken. Meantime, Chairman Mao, you and your party promoted social reform in the liberated areas. A new land law was promulgated at the start of the 1947 counteroffensive, stating that the land belongs to those cultivating. Former landlords were prosecuted and removed. Even though the United States military aid to the nationalists continued, you maintained a conviction that weapons were not the decisive factor. You believe that even atomic bombs cannot decide war. Thirty January, 1949, the People's Liberation Army marches into Peking. Crosses the Yangtze River on 21 April. Captures the capital, Nanking, on 24 April. Chairman Mao, British, French, Germans, Russians, Japanese, and Americans who had inflicted suffering on the Chinese were expelled from China, which for 100 years since the Opium War had been a paradise for foreigners. You, Chairman Mao, are about to realize your ideals. Even though the nationalists tried to prevent it, people in the Guomindang controlled territory began cooperating with the PLA. The nationalist government finally moved to Taiwan. Twenty-four May 1949, the People's Liberation Army victoriously marches into Shanghai, which was once a hell for Chinese residents, and signs saying no dogs in Chinese allowed were posted in the park. Citizens cheered the PLA.
1 October 1949, the Chinese People's Republic is established. Reflecting back as you watch the celebration, you can recall the May movement took place. You were 25 then, now you are 55. You are the CCP representative of other factions and parties, representative of district, military, and people's organizations. You are elected chairman of the Central People's Government through the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. You proclaim the establishment of the Central Government of the People's Republic of China. A new flag is flying. What is on your mind as you watch it? What was on the minds of your comrades who lived through 30 years of struggles and battles? Yu Shaoqi, Zhou Enlai, Hong Chun, Ho Lung, Sung Ching Ling, Zhu Da. This must have been your greatest day. And on this day, your statement comes to life. All reactionaries are paper tigers. In appearance, the reactionaries are terrifying, but in reality, they are not so powerful. From a long-term point of view, it is not the reactionaries, but the people who are really powerful. Chairman Mao, we will return to the first scene. Now only Lin Biao, considered your closest comrade, stands next to you. Some of those who joined in the celebration of the birth of a nation 18 years ago at Tiananmen have been purged. Those remaining have been pushed back from your side. But the great proletarian cultural revolution directed by you moved violently on. あなたはもちろん大変よろしいと言いました。ついには1959年にそれまであなたが兼任していた国家主席の地位を引き継いでから後、世界中があなたの後継者だと信じてきた劉少奇こそが資本主義の道を歩む。In 1959, Liu Xiaoqi was firmly pleased to be your successor. He became chairman of the People's Republic of China, a position held concurrently by you. Then he came under strong criticism as one of those treading the path of capitalism. He had said that the class struggle was already eliminated and this was heresy. You stood up to state that the class struggle continues in capitalistic countries and therefore continuing revolution is necessary and that those who did not concur had to be disposed of. And Liu Xiaoqi was purged from the CCP in October 1968 and disappeared from the political scene. Many other influential leaders were also purged. Do you recall, Chairman Mao, the secret meeting you had with Stalin and other Soviet leaders in late 1949 and early 1950? Those were the days of Socialist Brotherhood. But, 
But the CCP criticized the freedom of the economy and ideology in the Soviet Union. This followed the criticism started in 1956. The CCP also criticized Khrushchev's peaceful coexistence policy toward the United States. The Soviet Union retaliated by withdrawing 1,300 Soviet technicians who were assisting in the construction of China. Chairman Mao, you must know that even in socialist countries, corruption and degeneration of power occurs. Prevention of this has become one of your biggest reasons for instigating another revolution. Chairman Mao, you lost your oldest son, Mao Anying, in the Korean War. The sixth member of your family sacrificed for a revolutionary war. You said that you do not mix feelings with politics. You said that you considered the United States government the chief enemy in its continued support of the nationalists. But while faced with two great enemies, you extended the hand of friendship toward leaders in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, many of whom have now vanished from the scene. Chairman Mao, you anticipate the strength of worldwide masses in a revolutionary strategy of backward nations overthrowing advanced nations. But realistically, isn't the strength of the Chinese masses the only thing that you can actually grasp? You had to rely on the strength of your friends among the masses to carry out the Cultural Revolution. During the Ninth Party Congress in April 1969, you designated Lin Biao as your successor and established a new centralized authority of the party. This means, Chairman Mao, that you have reinstated friends who were once disposed of through the Cultural Revolution. Isn't this a form of contradiction? At the same time, the Ninth Party Congress was emphasizing the necessity of continuing revolution to cloak the contradiction. The world is yours as well as ours, you said. But in the last analysis, it is yours. You young people, full of vigor and vitality, are in the bloom of life, like the sun at eight or nine in the morning. Our hope is placed in you. The world belongs to you. Chairman Mao, was one of the reasons for starting the Great Cultural Revolution to give these young people the experience of revolution using farmers and workers as teachers. However, organizing revolution and engaging in revolution are not the same. If these young people who through your leadership obtain this experience of revolution but do not possess the power of revolution, then the Cultural Revolution, which you called, is in reality called only for the purpose of suppressing the true revolution. Chairman Mao, in January 1965, you said to Edgar Snow, the future generation of China will probably assess the revolutionary operations through their own merits and in terms of their own experience. 
and Marxism-Leninism may appear foolish to them. Your statement that China's future will be entrusted to the masses is believed to be magnificently human. Even though you said this, Chairman Mao, you appear to be trying to decide China's future while you are still living. Isn't this something of a contradiction? It is the contradiction, perhaps, of a great leader, for the fact that you, Chairman Mao, have survived many such contradictions may make you one of the great figures of the 20th century. The wreath presented by the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China to the great leader, Chairman Mao. Reads from party and state leaders, Hua Guofeng. Ye Jianying. Song Qingling. Wei Guoqing. Liu Bo Cheng, Xu Shi Yu, Ji Deng Kui, Wu De, Wang Dongxing, Chen Yong Kui, Chen Xi Lian, Li Xian Yan. Li De Sheng, Wu Gui Xian, Su Zhen Hua, Ni Zhi Fu, Sai Fu Din. On the left side of the hall, reads from Guo Mo Ruo, Nie Rong Zhen, Tan Zhen Lin. Zhang Dingcheng, Wu Lanfu, Zhou Jianren, Hu Jiewen, Yao Lianwei, Wang Zhen, Gu Mu, and Pebala Galie Namjie, Vice Chairman of the National Committee of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, CPPCC. On the right side, reads from Xu Xiangqian, Chen Yun, Li Jingquan, Cai Chang, Ngafeng Ngawang Jigmei, Xi De Heng, Li Su Wen, Yu Chu Li, Sun Jian, and Shen Yan Bing, Vice Chairman of the National Committee of the CPPCC. Reads from the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress, the State Council, the Military Commission of the Party Central Committee, the National Committee of the CPPCC, departments under the Party Central Committee and the State Council, the People's Liberation Army's Department, National Defense Science and Technology Commission, various services and branches, military academies, and military region commands, mass organizations, the party committees and revolutionary committees of 29 provinces, municipalities, and autonomous regions, compatriots from Taiwan province, reads from places where Chairman Mao carried on his great revolutionary activities and from the Da Qing Oil Field Party Committee and the Da Zhai Production Brigade Party Branch.
veterans of the Red Army and the Eighth Root Army, and veterans of the People's Liberation War, who fought valiantly under Chairman Mao. Revolutionary fighters who stood in the van of the great proletarian cultural revolution and representatives of the workers, peasants and soldiers and people from other walks of life all are plunged into the deepest grief Oh, Chairman Mao, you are the great liberator of the people of all nationalities in our country. Your love for us is deeper than the seas. Words cannot describe what you have done for us. It will be remembered for countless generations to come. President Kim Il-sung, the great leader of the Korean people, sent a wreath to Peking by special plane under the escort of Vice Foreign Minister Chon yong soo The wreath from President Kim...